Time to get started. Thanks for joining us and welcome. I'm Cliff Lynch. I'm the director of the Coalition for Networked Information. And you've reached uh, one of the project briefing sessions that are part of the spring 2020 virtual CNI member meeting, which will be running through the end of next week. Today, we have two presenters, uh, both from Johns Hopkins University, um, Saeed Chowdhury and Edwina Picken. Uh, and um, they will be uh, giving their presentation, after which we will field questions. Uh, Diane Goldenberg Hart from CNI will uh, moderate the Q&A. And I direct your attention to the Q&A tool at the bottom of the screen. Um, you can use that to type in questions at any time during the presentation. And we invite you to do exactly that. Um, uh, pose questions as they occur to you rather than waiting for the very end of the uh, presentation. Um, I just want to say a word or two about this. Um, there's something terribly ironic about a session given how what's happened over the last um, a couple of months and how closed many spaces are to us that looks at physical space. Although I would also note that the interplay between built spaces digital spaces and services has been a long-standing theme of CNI's um, interest and uh, certainly has been one of the centers, for example, of the work that um, our now emerita um, uh, um, associate uh, director, Joan Lippincott, has carried out over the last few years. At the same time, I expect that this is going to be a highly relevant presentation today because we are going to hear not just about implications of service provision in physical spaces, but also in library digital spaces. And I think um, that Saeed and Edwina are going to have some very enlightening and informative things to say about what's been happening in this area over the last couple of months. The need for student services didn't go away when we moved to remote instruction. If anything, it probably increased. So I'm looking forward to this presentation and it just remind, remains for me to thank you for joining us and express my gratitude to Saeed and Edwina for sharing this with us. And with that, over to you, Saeed. Uh, thank you, Cliff. Um, that was a very uh, kind and really Im important introduction because uh, I was actually going to cite uh, the considerable work that Joan has done over the years, uh, the context, the overall context that CNI has been uh, providing in terms of library spaces. And you're absolutely right that uh, topics of student services, particularly wellness and mental health, which is the focus of what we'll be talking about today, uh, not only remain important, but are probably even more important than ever. Uh, I certainly hope everybody's staying safe and healthy uh, during this unprecedented time. And uh, one interesting aspect of the timing and the way that CNI itself has done a pivot in terms of responding to the COVID crisis is we, we had to have a fairly major pivot uh, in, in the month of March when Hopkins, like many other institutions, basically went to online learning and uh, campus was basically shut down. So we had just started uh, the journey in terms of what it means to think about student services around wellness and mental health and, and physical space. Uh, and now, as you will hear in this presentation, we'll start to think about it a little bit uh, in, in the digital space as well. So Edwina is going to talk uh, about the actual um, student wellness initiatives. We, we've actually had an earlier presentation, so we're not going to go into too much depth around the research behind that, but rather the implementation of what we had done uh, in the middle, uh, early part of March, uh, late part of February, early part of March, which we eventually had to, to pivot uh, later in that month. And she's going to talk about how we become more integrated into the overall fabric of mental health and counseling efforts within the university and some of the questions that we need to explore 
uh, in, going into the future. And I, I'm going to provide a little bit of more of the context uh, and, and sort of overarching uh, framework that, that's important for this. And you can see this quote at the top of the slide that said, who owns this? Uh, and this is an actual quote from uh, our Vice Provost for Student Wellness at Hopkins. It's, it's worth noting that the fact that Hopkins has identified a Vice Provost for Student Wellness is a really important signal and initiative, uh, if you will. And he said this uh, when we launched what we're now calling a wellness station in the physical space of our learning commons. Uh, there were lots of uh, individuals from various student services coming into the space. We had a launch event uh, that was a, sort of a, a sort of showcase and uh, public uh, affirmation, if you will, about the importance of this in, in the context of library uh, spaces and working and collaborating with the library. And he asked this question and said, here is this wellness resource that his office supported and collaborated with us, but it's not in one of, quote, their spaces. Uh, and I think it, it sort of begged the question of how do you think about this in a more integrated way with the library as a partner? Uh, and as Cliff mentioned, uh, we, we've been looking at continuity of, of university and library types of services from a research perspective, as uh, you know, or may have seen in the email, the executive roundtable that CNI did on this uh, has produced a report around that. There's of course academic continuity in terms of how we continue to teach uh, in new ways. Uh, but there, there is clearly, as Cliff mentioned, a need to think about student service continuity uh, and the continuity of wellness services. Uh, and that's, that's challenging uh, in its own right. And we'll, we'll go into a little bit about why that, that's the case. And one uh, important overarching, I guess, question maybe is, I, I think it's fair, and I'd be curious to hear what others think of this, that we, we in libraries, particularly when it comes to our spaces, are more comfortable with the idea of supporting academic functions. Uh, it's my understanding that this is not the case, at least not yet, uh, at Hopkins, but that many libraries actually have classes uh, in their spaces, at least during certain hours of the day. We are quite uh, comfortable or at least even supportive of graduate students maybe having office hours and, and of course students uh, collaborating on academic work in libraries. But the, the growing question of whether student services types of activities are also uh, an appropriate uh, or a natural kind of function that should exist in, in library spaces as well. You know, what we found uh, earlier in, in the year is student services office uh, folks were coming into the library and literally setting up a, a table in the cafe. And they would just put a little table tent saying, do you need help on career counseling? Do you need help uh, on, on you know, mental health counseling and so on? And we as a library and our, our management team weren't quite sure what to make of this. Is this something that is appropriate? Is it something we should support? Is it something we should advance? Is it something on which we should partner? So that, that overarching theme of how are library spaces potentially uh, usable and important for not only academic functions, but student services is, is the overarching kind of lens that I think is very important for this. And of course, a uh, major question is how will this change uh, given what's happened with, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the fact that so much of our activity is now online and, and, and a good portion of it at least will, will continue to be for the foreseeable future. So it'll be really critical for us to imagine uh, what all this means in the long term as well. Uh, a little bit about the arc of uh, the work that we've done. Again, we've, we've talked about this uh, in, in previous sessions, so I won't go into this for too much detail, but I, I do think it's helpful to understand this in case you didn't see those presentations. We, we've had uh, three iterations of large scale visualization or displays in a very high traffic public space within our uh, learning commons in a building called the Brody Learning Commons. It was not a space originally designed for such usage. We, we did not, uh, our, our learning commons was uh, uh, launched you know, about nine years ago at this point. We did not have uh, dedicated spaces for visualization or displays that you see in other libraries. So we tried to explore whether it could be spontaneously sort of organically created within a space that wasn't or originally intended for that. We started off with uh, custom developed hardware and software that was largely a research project prompted by computer science department, the chair of computer science uh, department at the time, was interested in different forms of interaction uh, with large displays. Uh, and we had a graduate student who developed all of the hardware and the software and we put it in the space. 
the second iteration or incarnation of it was an attempt to tie it more to medical uh, research and to explicitly focus on games. What we learned from the first iteration was that a, a game uh, that was available on that platform was the most popular by far uh, of any of the things we put on there. So we were a little bit more intentional, a little bit more specific, focusing on games and thinking about it in the context of, of a medical project. We worked with a group that had an artistic and a design background. Um, as you'll see from the pictures, the first version was not particularly aesthetically uh, pleasing or interesting. And the second version started to incorporate some design and artistic elements. And then finally, where we are, or, or where we were, I should say, uh, a few weeks ago, we really embraced this idea of games for student wellness at Lena's prior research informed that uh, in a very significant way. And we streamlined the hardware and the on software and made it much more commodity based. So it's not really complicated technology anymore, but it's much more accessible, it's much more usable. Uh, and it is very much focused around student wellness. And if you just sort of go through these three different slides that I'll show you, this is the first incarnation. The person standing in front of the deck is Kel Guerin. He was the graduate student in computer science who designed this. And th there were certainly interesting aspects of this and some, some important lessons we learned. But we, we, the fundamental lesson was this, this was just too complex, uh, too difficult to maintain, uh, and that games were really the most engaging aspect of it. The second iteration is what you see here, and that table that you see in front of you is the artistic piece that was introduced as part of the next incarnation, sort of trying to draw the eye and you know, draw your interest to the space. And it was around one of these games that I'd mentioned that was medically focused. Uh, and then the current iteration, uh, or what we had as the current iteration, is what you see here. Uh, so you can see it's basically a kiosk at this point with a standard iPad embedded within that kiosk connected to a display. It's not a particularly large display at this point. Uh, you can see students as they're apt to do sort of taking over the space, so to speak. It is their space, so it's not really taking over, which is sort of becoming much more fun comfortable with being near the display. Uh, and you see these clouds uh, on top that I'll, I'll let Edwina talk about. Uh, but it's uh, those are clouds that were created by a local artists, and they're very important uh, in terms of a theme that we've developed around wellness uh, and the library support for that. So uh, I will turn it over to Edwina, who's going to talk about uh, that particular setup and what we're now calling the wellness station. Thank you, Saeed. Um, so yes, yeah, so uh, the most recent iteration of the visualization space, which now is the wellness station, um, really has sort of crystallized around the idea of providing wellness resources to students, giving them a portal through which they can access counseling resources from Hopkins, but also a variety of games that uh, I've researched and have benefits for stress relief and sort of um, sort of brief anxiety um, help. And so all of this uh, has been inspired by the fact that Hopkins uh, released a mental health task force report in, in 2018, uh, where they identified student mental health as a university priority. And the vice provost for student mental health and wellness is one of those offices that, that came out of this uh, task force report. And so when they did a survey out of Hopkins students, they found really especially high levels of stress and anxiety at Hopkins compared to similar schools. Um, and they found they had quotes such as, you know, it feels like a pressure cooker um, at Hopkins or, um, you know, it's difficult to identify and find resources to get help. And one of the ones that really hit close to home for us was that the library uh, was one of the places where students feel most stressed. Um, and that makes sense because that's where, you know, they're studying and they're working, but it's also where they're gathering um, just to be with their peers. And it, it creates a climate uh, that it does not promote a very healthy environment. And so we really, with this library space, wanted to create um, an area in the environment that would provide students uh, with some sort of stress relief 
bringing it to them instead of having them go out and find it themselves when they're already feeling stressed. Um, and so some of the recommendations from the task force were that we needed to create a climate of awareness and support for student mental health and wellness and stress reduction and promote resilience in the context of stressful situations. And what role can the library play in that? We thought making this wellness station, a kind of centralized station with an access portal to counseling center resources, to wellness uh, resources, but also financial and academic resources all in one place. So instead of them having to come to the library and set up their tables, students can just access it centrally. Um, and then the added art place, um, art installation that you saw there with the clouds um, is a piece of artwork uh, titled The Rainbow Nimbus, which is comprised of uh, Said, if you could go back one slide so we can see the cloud again. Um, so these are colorful sculpted clouds, which were designed by a local ba uh, Baltimore artist called Operation Arts, the Alliance for Responsible Trade and Sustainability. And the clouds actually emit patterns of lights and sounds um, that are aiming to support mental health through kind of the psychology of color theory and light therapy that represent different changes in patterns in the human mind. Um, it was kind of the idea that, you know, in your mind, there's a constant input of thoughts and feelings and information that can cause stress and anxiety and can turn adverse and affect your mental health and physical wellness. And so the clouds were also kind of a shout out to one of the counseling center at Hopkins new um, intervention called Silver Cloud, um, which is a cognitive behavioral therapy uh, online uh, base, um, what is it called? Um, it's kind of a service where all undergraduate students can have access to CBT. And so we, they were launching it in around February. And so we teamed up with the Counseling Center and with the uh, Student Affairs Office and decided that we would have a launch date, kind of a launch event, where we would have uh, the Vice Provost and uh, psychologists, counselors, people from the Rec Center, all coming to the Wellness Station. We would have a Silver Cloud up on the a wellness station screen and then we would allow students to come by and ask questions and we could talk them through the resources and kind of show them um, what it's like um, because one of the reasons one of the reasons we hypothesized that the station in the past wasn't getting very much use was because we never formally introduced it to students we would sort of put up the screen and it would be we would have things on it but we never um, introduced it to students and said, you know, this is its purpose and it's for you, for you to use it, for you to own it. Um, and so when working with the counselors and with student affairs, they really encouraged us to have this launch event. Um, and we also really wanted to stress to the students uh, that these resources and the games, the small casual games on the station were not a substitute at all um, for counseling, that they're not intended to minimize or address the serious issues that students are facing, um, but they are significant in that they're offering small interventions and breaks from stress, very small steps that may be helpful or useful for getting through the moment. Um, because what I found in my research is that not all um, leisure activities are created equally when it comes to uh, rejuvenating and when it comes to restoring your mood. And so if a student is stressed out before an exam and they can choose to either scroll through social media or you know, sit there and do nothing or play a quick game of Tetris on the wall, uh, there's actually research evidence that they will be less stressed if they play a game in which they can feel like they're making progress and having achievements um, and if there's a, a social aspect where they can come together and feel a sense of community and laugh together, um, that's even better. 
Um, and can we advance to the next slide? Uh, so we had this launch event back in February and it was really exciting to see all the students who were very interested. Um, but we only had about two weeks of usage in the physical space before uh, COVID-19 um, uh, forced us to shut down the library. Um, but we did have, we were tracking how often the games were used um, using the iPads um, tracking functions. And so we do have some anecdotal evidence that the games were used pretty regularly and as for the counseling websites. And so in transitioning to digital resources, we decided that we would create a blog post on the Johns Hopkins Library website in collaboration with Student Wellness Office in order to post uh, links to all of the games that were on the wellness station and all of the resources so that students could have uh, an equivalent digital space to the wellness station where everything is there. And there were many physical constraints because of, uh, for example, the iPad could only support games that were in landscape mode, not uh, portrait mode. And so by having the digital blog post, we were able to kind of open up the range of resources that we could provide students with. And to promote connection to the space and to the university, we also included a recording, a video recording of the clouds, so of the rainbow nimbus clouds changing colors and responding to ambient sounds in the environment. And so we put a little two minute loop of the clouds online and then invited students to download that and you know, add their own soundtrack if they wanted to, just to kind of promote connection to the university. Um, and we've been participating uh, monthly in uh, mental health task force meetings with the university. So it's really been uh, an incredible journey for the library to have come from a place where uh, student affairs and student services will use the space to kind of try to get students' attention and and uh, use it for their own uh, for their own endeavors. And now it's more of a collaboration where we are helping each other um, to get the word out and. Um, we're looking, we're going to have another blog post in a few months and we're working in tandem directly with Student Affairs um, and it's kind of unclear. Uh, Hopkins is still deciding whether or not students will be coming back in the fall, um, but we are very much looking into how the environment can support wellness in a way that you know, excellence and wellness are not mutually exclusive. And I think that's a, um, a statement that at, at Hopkins, it often gets overlooked, that wellness is not in competition with excellence. It enhances it. And that's really the, uh, the message that we want to get across in the library. Um, next slide. So that's uh, Another picture of the clouds. This is after the shutdown, so it's it's an empty space, but um, they respond to noise and music in the environment. They're pretty, um, what's the word, endearing, these clouds. And they've uh, actually, Hopkins has, has uh, had some ideas of maybe using these clouds as a symbol of wellness throughout the university. So you could have one of these clouds in the counseling center or one of these clouds um, at maybe the School of Education or the School of Public Health in their wellness spaces to provide kind of a unifying wellness symbol in these spaces. Because I think what was really lacking for students was a sense of unity and a sense of a, a mission for their own wellness. Everything was very disjointed. The main, what came first was academic excellence and what came second was, you know, we'll take care of you. Um, and so, yeah, we're really looking forward to um, seeing how we can continue to help students because with the COVID pandemic, there's been an increase in all mental health issues, so not only anxiety and depression, but 
there's been increased eating disorders, there's been increased uh, trauma and abuse, and there have been compromised abilities to provide support and resources. So for example, a lot of counselors are unable to provide students with their normal counseling because their licenses do not uh, cross state lines. And we're working, we're in these meetings with the counseling center directly. So when they find out that they have a new update for telehealth, we can update our blog post and let students know immediately or when uh, counselors say that they're going to have a virtual discussion space for students, we can update our blog post with that too. Um, and we're really just trying as much as possible to have a digital community um, that is a reasonable facsimile for uh, the, the wellness station space. Um, but we're going to have to reconsider what it means to offer space as a community gathering or research space uh, as a library going forward. Um, with students there or without students there. So, um, and yes, this initiative has been conducted under the auspices of the Association for Research Libraries Research Library Impact Framework Pilot Program, which will be continuing throughout this year. And uh, I think now we'll open it up to any questions. Unless you have more to say, Saeed? Uh, I do, but there's a helicopter right overhead, so I'm going to be on mute for a few seconds. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I'll just take a moment to thank you both while we're waiting for the helicopter to clear Saeed's um, airspace. <laughs> thank you both, Edwina and Saeed, for that really interesting discussion. Um, and I think I'll go ahead and read aloud Christine Wolf Eisenberg's question while we're waiting for Saeed. Uh, Saeed, I'll just keep an eye on your um, microphone and when it goes unmute, I'll hand it back over to you. Uh, so Christine writes, I wonder if students reported feeling particularly stressed in the library because it's the place they go on campus where they feel most able to tackle especially challenging or complex projects and tasks. Any sense of whether this is the case at uh, Johns Hopkins? And she continues, uh, not sure whether the, the answer to my question matters for the space design, either physical and or digital, but if so, would be interested in hearing how. So. So I, I think uh, people can hear me now. Yes. <laughs> At least I hope so. Yes. Um, I, one of the maybe somewhat unique characteristics of Hopkins is we actually don't have a student union. Um, so the library ends up becoming a gathering spot for uh, the students in a way that may not be true at other institutions. So in addition to having a large number of the students coming through for various kinds of reasons, I, I think that the, the reality is that th since they are in fact mostly in the library to study and to attack these kinds of complex projects and tasks, that is a stress inducing kind of experience. Mm -hmm. But because they also view it as a social space, so one, one interesting data point is the senior class chooses to have its farewell party in the library. There's that sort of attachment there. Uh, I think it's that combination of I'm here to study, which is stressful, but I'm also here to socialize and I'm also here to de-stress mm -hmm. and get away from that is what's prompting us to move a lot of the wellness resources to where they are rather than assuming it's sort of a bifurcated or, or delineated space. It's it's, it's a fluid kind of movement between study, stress, activity versus I now want to unwind and relax because I want to talk to my friend. Right. So that's really interesting. An important point. Edwina, did you want to weigh in on that? Uh, yeah, I think we just um, really want to kind of reconceptualize as the library as a, a multidimensional space. So it's not just for, for studying or for reading. Honestly, most of the students aren't reading there um, or taking out books, but it's a really place for engagement, whether it's engagement in, in academics or with each other or in wellness. Um, we just want to sort of facilitate that as much as possible. Right. Okay, thank you. And thanks for that question, Christine. Uh, we have a question now from Stephen Bell. How do you differentiate for students the difference between your wellness space and the Campus Wellness Center? So I, I, I 
should verify this with Edwina. I don't believe there is a dedicated campus wellness center. Um, mm. There is a there is a counseling center certainly, um, but to her earlier point, we're being very careful to 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 make sure people don't think we're trying to substitute for dedicated professional counseling. In in terms of wellness activities, um, as she alluded to from that task force report and the subsequent activities and decisions of these institutions, we don't have a cohesive coordinated sense of wellness across the different institute, the different campuses, the different divisions, and the different entities. Mm -hmm. So to that point of the vice provost question, who owns this? Everybody should own this. Mm -hmm. it, it's not something that only the wellness center should do, or only the counseling center should do, or only the library, but rather students don't necessarily view it as I'm now in the counseling space and I'm in the library space. It's I have an issue. I have a problem. I'd like to get it resolved. And, and understanding that, you know, we're never going to become a counseling center and a counseling center is never going to become a library. But is there some middle ground where we can meet so that students aren't constantly confused about where to go and that no matter where you are, no matter what mode you're in as a student, whether it's social or academic, you get the support and the resources you need, or at least you get a pointer to the support and the resources you need. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's really important because the counseling center was having a lot of um, issues where there would be very long wait times where students would try to make appointments and they would have two, three, four weeks before they'd be able to see a counselor. Mm. Um, and also just the issue of the, the stigma of mental health, but also where you know, you're know you not gonna go see a counselor, go to the counseling center until things are bad enough that sometimes it's it's too late or there's already been um, you know, significant issues or, or problems that you've had. Mm -hmm. So the idea of trying to integrate wellness so it becomes more part of the everyday um, living of the university um, is, is really part of our goal. Um, and there actually is the counseling center set up a little um, kind of more casual chat with a counselor uh, function in the library. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just down the hall from this wellness station where for a few hours each week uh, they have a counselor who just sits in the room and students can go and it's called chat with the counselor um, and it's kind of a more casual service and we but we point to that on the wall and we're looking into how when that counselor is in we can have sort of an, an active tracking button on the wall that, that sort of points to there and says you know in the green light that says you know they're in right now go go check it out um, just to increase awareness right well and i think um i think you said sort of at the beginning of your presentation that um originally part of the impetus for this was that you were noticing that student services was setting up in the library is that right did i understand that correctly yeah, that's correct it was spontaneous they would basically go to the cafe and, and sit at the table and say right. we're available and and did, did you ever did you do you know what what drove them to do that i mean was that part of your strategizing with this uh, i think they recognize that it's where the students go they they had the same motivation as can we move right. our services and our presence to where the students are rather than expecting them to come to us Right, it's so interesting. It's fascinating. And so, and Christine uh, Wolf Eisenberg also just wanted to comment, uh, you know, such important context regarding the lack of the student union. Thank you. Uh, have seen this play out of, at a few other institutions and I'm familiar with some of the same challenges that this presents. So, and I think uh, Stephen Bell also relating to this, um, this thread, he asks, haven't past uh, project info lit reports identified uh, the stress is related to library anxiety and getting stressed out about having to do research in our somewhat overwhelming research environments and lacking confidence in one's ability to, to do college level research. So, yeah. That's... Yeah, that's a very good point. And I, I think one thing that uh, Edwin had talked about in the previous CNI presentation is we, we have, you know, I, I guess the premise that people will actually study better, you know, to this point of excellence and wellness and not at odds, but actually reinforcing that people will actually absorb information better and think more clearly and be able to do things better if they have a sense of balance. Yeah. So uh, trying to introduce that balance into the space where they may feel unbalanced for whatever reason, and this is not only unique to libraries, I'm sure there are other places on campus where people feel stressed, 
but just trying to introduce that sense of balance no matter where they might be is really important, I think. Right, right, so true. Well, that was uh, terrific and some really great questions. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, please feel free to type them in to the Q&A box. raise your hand um, and I can turn on your mic. So with that, um, I just want to thank our presenters one last time for sharing your work with us here at CNI. Thank you so much and thank you to our attendees for making time for us here today. Hope to see you back at CNI really soon. Take care everyone.